All right, everybody, welcome to our discussion this evening with Catherine Edelman, who owns and operates one of the finest galleries in Chicago that focuses nine, no, that's a good pun, focuses on photography. And, you know, I, I, I've talked to Catherine about this previously, and I'm interested in, you know, I asked you this before, but, you know, how did you get from, where you, you were in high school in New York, how did you get from there to being an exemplary art dealer? Oh, well, I can only say how I got from there to Chicago. Um, and I came out, to, well, I ended up going to about four different colleges before I settled on um, Philadelphia College of Art for undergrad school. Um, started out in metalsmithing and then ended up switching to photography in my sophomore year. Um, and then because I didn't know what to do, um, a friend uh, who was out in Chicago suggested I go to grad school, and so I applied to the Art Institute, um, which is the only school I applied to, and thankfully got in. And so I moved out to Chicago uh, to go to grad school with the idea that I was just going to keep going west and end up uh, somewhere out in California. But um, during grad school, I made the uh, decision to open up a gallery um, about three or four months before I um, graduated, and so put the corporate structure together and only meant to do it for five years, and here we are. Oh, wait, and, didn't, you uh, work for, didn't you work for somebody after you went to grad school? Or? No, I didn't work for anybody. I just did everything trial and error. Well, sort of like I did. You throw it at the wall, and if it works, you keep going. How, how old were you when you opened your first gallery? Uh, 25. I did mine when I was 26, and so now you've had it, what, six years, and you're 31? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's very sweet. Yeah, we just celebrated 24 years. Oh, you're 24 years old now. No, you've been I open am. 20, you've been, you've had a gallery that long, 24 years, and yeah. do you still love it, or do you still hate it, or, I mean, how have your emotions changed in regard to having a gallery that long? Um, I think it's a love-hate relationship, but... Um, but by and large, it, it, uh, there's nothing quite like owning your own business because you really get to make up all the rules as you go along. And so um, on the one hand, you have nobody to complain to but yourself if you do things poorly. And uh, if you do things well, you can take time off when you need to. And so it, uh, in the long run, it all works out. How successful was your gallery in the first three years of operating it? Oh, it was terrible. It was terrible. I... Um, for those in the crowd, and I can only see four people on my screen, so I don't really know the average age of the You can click on the dots but, um, underneath and see more, you know, and or you can scroll through those by clicking around. Oh, cool. Oh, yes, I just got a whole group of other people. Um, <laughs> well, I opened up the gallery. Um, uh, I signed the lease in, in October of 87, and then the stock market crashed, um, uh, the first one in my lifetime. Um, and then, um, so that was a really ominous start. And then in 91, 92, we had the first Gulf War, followed by what was the first significant recession um, that I was affected by. And so as Paul, as you'll recall, um, 16 or 17 galleries in River North closed in around 1992, 93. It was really dreary um, uh, between the, Chicago, the fire in 89, um, and then, and then the the recession. It, it was very, very difficult. So I had a five-year plan, um, which got derailed a bit um, by the third year. Do you feel like there's a relationship between the health of the economy and the health of your gallery business? Oh yeah, it goes hand in hand. Um, pretty much linear, pretty much simultaneously, or the art world goes south before the economy and then comes back afterwards. Well, that's interesting. I mean, um, in 2007, I started noticing some really strange things happening with my, um, my, my core clientele. <clears throat> and I talked to a friend of mine who at the time was the, was, um, the CEO of a major company in money management. And he, uh, I told him, I said, something really funky is going on here. And, and, he, and he said, yeah, you know, something about big is about to happen. But I, I talked to all my colleagues and you know, New York, LA, et cetera, and nobody, everybody was doing great, and I was starting to really have some issues, and then, of course, you know, um, it hit in 2008. Um, so, I mean, it's hard to say. I, I think I felt it first, 
um, among, or at least I was the first to acknowledge it. You know, sometimes it's people see that as a weakness to acknowledge that you're having issues, but you know, nothing I was doing wrong. It was the economy, right. and um, but I think it's normally a parallel line. If I had to figure it out, I mean, when the stock market goes up, all of a sudden we're selling stuff, and when uh, people are feeling better, they they come back again, and so it's pretty hand in hand with the with the with the markets. Which when you open your gallery, I'm sorry. When you opened your gallery in the mid '80s, <laughs> did you did you represent artists within the first year? Yeah, when I opened up, um, I signed the lease for December 1st of '87. I had spent that summer running around the country, introducing myself to the various um, curators and all the museums um, and the the photo curators, and um, you know, introduced myself and said, "Hi, I'm Catherine Edelman. I'm opening up a gallery. Will you vouch for me?" And, uh, you know, will you give me the names of some collectors? And by and large, they all did, which was really quite remarkable. Because there's a museum you know, people or gallery people who gave you the museum names? Museum people. Okay. Now, this was museum people. I probably looked like I was 15, you know, so they were both kind of um, tickled by the whole concept. And they're very generous. It was a very different time in the art world back then. I mean, not that people aren't generous today, but I don't think you've access like we did back then. And and so then I would use their names when calling various artists. So, um, you know, I'd rehearse in the beginning when I wanted to call artists. And um, and one of my first calls was actually to Bruce Weber, who at the time was um, working on Broken Noses, so he couldn't um, open up the gallery. And so the second person on my list was Nan Golden. And uh, prior to that, she'd never had a show of the ballads, so, uh, which I didn't know um, at the time. And um, so she opened up the gallery, and um, and I think I rep probably oh I don't know, hard to remember maybe ten artists in the beginning, um, only one or two that are still with me. How all right and but that's nice. How how what ends relationships like that? Um, is it, sometimes it's you and sometimes it's them. With the artist. Yeah. Oh, I'd say by and large, it's usually me who ends the relationship because most artists will be happy just having their work sitting in a box doing nothing rather than not have the work there. But, you know, there's an ebb and flow. And um, sometimes I make a mistake. You know, I think I, I like the work and I live with it and I, I realize I just don't. Other times. What's the biggest, criteria? Um, What's the biggest criteria there? How much do you. I mean, do you like work that you sell, or do you lose interest sometimes in stuff that's finan you know financially successful? Well, I don't. I don't take on people um, thinking I'm going to make money. I think that's a. I mean, maybe I'd be richer if I did, but um, I think the the that's a mistake. And um, I take on work that I really love, and I have to love it in order to sell it. But sometimes um, I've made mistakes. You know, I thought I loved it until I lived with it, and or I love the work, but I really had a hard time um, working with the artist because, you know, sometimes that's not um, it's not the easiest relationship. It's a very difficult relationship, the artist-dealer um, situation. And uh, and then sometimes, you know, artists just don't make another body of work that um, that's of the same strength or in the same uh, mode, if you will, um, and and or you know, they move on. I mean, there's so many different circumstances um, as to the longevity of an artist. But you see it happen all the time. Artists are usually with a gallery 10, 12 years. And then, you know, the dealer's probably done as much as they can for them, um, except like with me and Michael Kenna, who's been with the gallery for 23 and a half years. Um, there are very few artists that, that have sustained me and I've sustained them. Does a fair portion of your well-being determined by the money the gallery makes? <laughs> um, I'd say my entire well-being is dependent on what the gallery makes, yeah. So to an extent, then, how well, how well people sell is relevant to what's going on. Yeah. I mean, there's some galleries that we've met with not recently, but in the past, where you know the, the proprietor is independently well off, and they seek to break even or not lose money, 
And then there's some galleries, perhaps like yourself and maybe uh, William Lieberman, who will be meeting with at a later date, who depend on the gallery for all their income. And yeah. I think that, you know, I think that's something that's really interesting because, you know, there's one gallery that doesn't need to make money. It's a question of, you know, how much I love your work, let's see what I can do and have a really nice, fuzzy, warm relationship. But that isn't necessarily su sufficient for the artist and or the dealer. And, you know, the question I would have of artists frequently is, you know, what kind of relationship would you prefer to be in? Um, I notice we're frozen here, but I can still oh, hear yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that's an interesting point. I mean, the history of, as hopefully most of your participants know, the history of art galleries um, was wealthy um, folks who, you know, had galleries. They didn't necessarily have to make money, so it was more a not-for-profit. Um, when I first opened, uh, David Ruttenberg, who he wouldn't mind me telling the story, even though he's been deceased now for a number of years, he asked me who my sugar daddy was. That was my first introduction to um, one of the biggest collectors in the country who happened to live in Chicago. I told him I didn't have one, but that I'd be well, you know, he was welcome to finance me if he wanted to, but he didn't seem to take me up on the offer. Um, you know, I, I don't come, it's just me and myself, and um, you know, so so I have to make money, um, but I try to balance the artists and the gallery who uh, um, sell uh, with the artists who don't. And obviously, I have to have um, enough people that keep the gallery going that takes care of two thirds of the artists who probably don't sell more than a handful of pieces a year or maybe every other year. And if that's, you know, but most artists want their work to be seen. And so I think hunger on a dealer's part is uh, very important. Um, I mean, that's just my personal opinion. I think if I wasn't hungry, I, well, I wouldn't have to really go to work that much and I could let somebody else run it. And, um, you know, I go out and I hustle and do art fairs, et cetera, and, you know, trunk shows and run around the place showing work. And if I didn't need to make money, I don't know that my artist would get that much attention. You're not at the gallery all the time, though, right? I mean, some days you go out to lunch, et cetera. I mean, are, are there sales that happen when you're not there? Uh, well, I, I do I do like to go out for lunch every now and then, but it's usually under the faux, under the pretense of client. Um, I have really good staff now. It's, it took 20 years, um, and I made a conscious decision about, um, oh, I don't know, four years ago maybe that I was no longer going to be the primary seller uh, so that any new folks who came in the gallery, um, any consultants, interior designers, you know, the whole kit and caboodle, I was not going to work with them unless they were building major collections. That I was going to focus more on um, the larger collections and um, moving the gallery forward. And um, and so I have my, you know, regular clients who will only deal with me. But all the new folks really uh, have now taken, have been taken over by my staff. And I think that's terrific. And I'm very happy. And it gives them autonomy as well, which I think is important when you have employees. So do they get a salary and a percentage of sales that they make? Is that how that works? No, they just get salary. I've never been one for commission. I think it sets up a really bad dynamic in the gallery so that, if I venture out and say hello to somebody, they might think I'm stealing money from them. So um, they get nice bonuses. Okay. When I had a gallery, I they had a salary and a commission, but I think... Yeah, that was 20 years ago. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> no problem. So how many artists have you represented in 24 years? No, oh, I have no idea. I'd I say, know, um, but yes. Um, 72. I I've probably, I mean, I, I, there's a difference between representation and exhibiting, so I've probably... Well, let's discuss shown, that. Let's discuss that. Well, representation, you know, is, a, is an arrangement that has longevity, that um, has a dedication that goes beyond just an exhibition and or just having inventory in the gallery. It, it's a commitment that um, I take very seriously. Um, that um, I used to have contracts, but I don't know, we don't really do contracts anymore, we just put it all in an email. Um, and so up until a few years ago, I was only representing, I would only show people if, if I represented them 
More recently, I've come to the conclusion on the way in which the art world is changing so much in the last few years and the economy going up and down that uh, I'm actually showing people uh, with the understanding that they might only have one show. I might not take them on. Um, when you say understanding, that's an understanding that they have also or just an yes. understanding that you have? No, I'm very clear with the artists when I work with them that uh, that it'll be an exhibition only and or it'll be a, a long-term commitment. And it's usually a one-year trial period anyways to make sure we all get along and uh, that everybody's getting out of it what they want so that it avoids that whole breakup that tends to happen between dealer and artist when things go south. Um, I find a year is a good time for us to kind of feel each other out, see how, how we get along, see how uh, together they are as an artist and as a business person and you know see um, kind of the correspondence and uh, there's so much that goes into the relationship of a dealer and an artist besides just the work. And I find that a year trial basis when I do go to take somebody on is very important because then we can both walk away without hurt feelings, so to speak. So if you do an ex exhibition with someone that implies a lesser commitment, mm -hmm. um, yeah. how many artists have you taken on in the past, say, 12 months? I've taken on three artists in the last three years, um, two of them in the last year, and then one about a year and a half ago. Um, I don't take on artists very often anymore. Um, how many artists have left in that period of time? Or have you severed relationships with, either way? I've sent back, um, well, August is usually the time that work goes back, um, summertime when we have a little time to think. But um, I think I sent back, I, I really don't know, maybe three or four artists in the last, you know, four, three or four years. Um, and there's certainly a number of, of people I've been thinking about um, having the dialogue with. Because I mean, I haven't sold their work in seven, eight years, and so I don't know, you know, what the point is of just having work sitting there if I'm not doing doing anything for them. How many uh, artists but, do you represent? You know, usually, it usually takes me. I think we have about thirty-six. I think changes. And those three artists that you've taken on in the past few years, have they had exhibitions, or are they anticipated? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, they each had. Uh, Daniel Beltra, who will be installing tomorrow, um, I just took him on with the understanding that we're going to give it a go. Um, so he'll have a sh the show will open Friday night, and then I'm going to take a piece right off the wall and go to an art fair uh, next month with it while his show's still up, and then uh, really push him in Chicago at the fair in September. Um, and you know, with the understanding that it could be a tough sell, it's um, difficult work, but uh, we're going to give it a go. So how did these? How did he, for example, get on your radar? Did he walk in with slides? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, um, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> actually, actually, I just threw out about. I just went through files and found all these slides of people I didn't even know from nineteen. I don't know, ninety-two. Um, but no, I actually. Um, jury a lot of shows, and so there's, um, I don't know how many of your participants are photographers, but we have this amazing thing called Critical Mass, and it's about 500 photographers that end up getting sort of juried into this pool, and then they ask, oh, I don't know, I think it's 200 um, jurors, and it's uh, dealers, publishers, curators, um, yeah, mostly the three of us, and we look through all this work. I mean, just a ton of stuff. And it's a lot of stuff. How? Well, well, come out physically or on the internet? On the internet. Everything's done online now. Everything. Okay. Um, so they set up a whole system. I don't know what it's called, but it makes you can like you can literally whip through it like that. Um, not as fast as the one up with the slides, but pretty fast. And I saw Daniel's work on Critical Mass, and I wrote his name down, and then I was reading uh, something, and his name came up again, and I thought, huh, I think that's the same guy. I went back to my notes, and I went on to his website, which for all of you um, participants, I think that's a must now. All artists really have to have websites. And, um, and then uh, we started corresponding, and we get along extremely well. Haven't met him. I'll meet him uh, Friday. 
and um, just a really interesting, smart, smart guy. And the work's very smart and fantastic. So, and it was through a jury um, blind submission. By blind, you mean you didn't see the artist's name at the time you no. were doing the work, or blind no, by, no. what do you mean? You, you, well, you know their name, but it doesn't matter. I mean, you're just looking at the work. Once you like the work, then the name shows up. Um, but uh, blind because he didn't know I was looking at his work. He was just submitting to this sort of blank, uh, you know, registry, if you will, hoping that uh, he would win an award. I don't think he won an award, but, um, but uh, you know, he certainly wasn't submitting to me. He was submitting to a... Uh, a call for submission. When when that kind of experience happens, the artist doesn't have a very large resume, or they do. I mean, isn't, it, isn't that typically with somebody that's newer or without a big reputation? Uh, resumes, I don't even think resumes are up on the site. I don't think resumes have anything to do with it. Uh, my memory is it's just the work and um, titles, artist statement. If you if you choose to read it, there's an artist statement. Um, and then size and price of the work. I don't know why they do that, but um, uh, but you have to be inspired by that to then go to the next level to find out that information. But that's this one um, specific thing. Is that, a, is that a fairly common way of you beginning a relationship with an artist as a result of seeing it in, a jur in an exhibition you're during or in a, in a show you're during? I see, yeah, I see work either through shows that I'm jurying, which are quite a lot, um, and my staff, uh, I don't know, they do all this blog stuff, so we're always looking at all these different blogs, and they send me things, and there are a handful of sites that I go to time and time again uh, that post, um, you know, photographers' works. Um, I don't care about a resume. I don't care... I don't care how old somebody is. I don't care if you're a man or a woman. I don't care what your race is. I just care about the work. And so I'm just looking for work. And once I see work, if I like it, then I'll, you know, Google the artist's name and try to find their website and get a more in-depth, uh, you know, knowledge of what the work is. But uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, an, an artist that came to me um, who I don't represent anymore, but um, a friend of mine who worked out in a gallery in San Francisco told me about this artist who was um, who happened to be one of their collectors. And you know, a collector turned artist is always gets those of us in the business that we we, we sort of smile. Um, but uh, she's like, you know, you have to see his work. So I reached out to him and asked to see his work, and he refused to show it to me. <laughs> um, and then when he finally showed it to me, you know, I sold the work as I was unwrapping it. I mean, those were the days. Um, but his resume consisted of one paragraph listing every single job he'd ever had because he had no resume, and it was a great resume. It was just great. It was like Pizza Hut, you know, uh, <laughs> whatever he did from the age of however old he was until uh, he was an art director. So, um, you know, I'm not a big fan of the resume. Do you think that's typical of dealers in the United States? Um, I think there's two different camps. I think that, I mean, I've sat on a lot of panel discussions, and I think there are people who think that, you know, an MSA is incredibly necessary. And then there are people like me who know that I only went for my master's degree because I didn't know what else to do. Um, and so I just bided time. And um I think that it, it, there, there are definitely two different camps to that question, and I think that um, furthering your education generally means you've got more time to devote to yourself because, you know, once you enter reality, nobody cares about your work like your teachers did. Um, but that doesn't mean that the work's any better. So um, I just don't really care about a resume. Now, unfortunately, my collectors um, care about, you know, they do. I mean, they care about what collections people are in, et cetera. Um, but my job, like I just took on a completely unknown person who'd never shown work and she's sort of house, she's confined herself to her home. Um, and so my job was to get her into the collections because she wasn't in anywhere. So I did. 
um, and I'm still trying to. Um, so that's a long-winded answer to the resume. How do you advise artists who have asked you if they should go to graduate school and pursue an MFA? Uh, well, you can be honest here. It's all friends. I just, I just think it's a, it's a lot of money. Um, I think that, you know, like most people go to grad school for two reasons. They don't know whatever, what else to do in life, and so they go, they keep going to school until they get out into the real world, or they want to teach. And unfortunately, the way in which our school system's going these days, they force you to get that degree, but that doesn't mean, you know, we can see what's going on in schools right now. Uh, doesn't, it, it, it's not the, the best um, lineage for, for teaching, but that's what they force you to do. So I think it's better, uh, personally, I, I'm not a huge fan of grad school, um, but I've seen it, uh, be beneficial for some people you know I just think it's a I find most people who go to grad school are just biding time you and I agree on that um, oh I had another question and it went away maybe I'll find yeah. it when I ask you about art fairs how do you feel about participating in art fairs uh, I actually have come to love art fairs I used to find it a necessary <coughs> evil but I, uh, I actually love them um, I kind of thrive on the pressure, and it's kind of kind of a sick, uh, you know, way of thriving because it's 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 amazingly um, pressure filled financially. But um, I really enjoy that one on one conversation with people I don't know. Um, I have to get them to make a decision like instantly, which is so the antithesis of what we spend day in day out at a gallery doing, right? Because we're like supposedly building relationships with clients. And at an art fair, you, 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 you know, the, the art of, of, of everything that we practice comes together. And now some people could be cynical and call it the, you know, the, the sales pitch, but I, I, don't, I don't do a sales pitch. I just really enjoy watching people fall in love with art and helping them realize that they can own it. Now, you know, if they can't financially afford it, that's, that's you know, a, a different reality. But I really enjoy it. I have to say it's kind of a... I'm, I, I'm lucky that I enjoy it because it's the basis of my business now. It's, it's pretty much how we're making um, our ends meet is through our sales. Yeah, let, through me, our let me ask you further about that. What percentage of your sales in a given calendar year are out of through art sales? Dollar wise. The last two years, I'd say eight, eighty. In the last two years, I'd say eighty percent of my profits come from art fairs. That sort of suggests eighty percent of your sales. Oh, no, probably a fewer percentage of your sales because the stuff, yeah. you, the stuff at art fairs is a little higher price. You take higher yeah. price inventory. Yeah. Do you price the work at art fairs the same as if the piece was in the gallery. Oh, absolutely. Um, which has had a greater effect? Can you isolate this on the change of the art gallery business? Is it the internet, or is it art fairs, or is it like a mix? Oh, well, I mean, I think the biggest change on the gallery business, hands down, has been the Internet. I mean, uh, you know, I was just, uh, as I was saying, I was just going through the back room because it's just, at, I mean, there are things I didn't even know what they were, and found a slide binder, which is what it was called. And it was actually a three-ring binder with every artist's name on a piece of paper, and it, it said how many slides I sent out and to whom, and did I get them back, you know. So, you know, you think about that. We were doing like FedEx, and then and then we were faxing people. Um, now we expect answers instantly, and it's um, it's been an incredible uh, ride. It's just been incredible. I mean, we have clients all over the world because of the internet. Um, but then again, we also have clients all over the world because of art fairs. So hey, you guys, know, I'm gonna open I this up to questions in a sec. I'm sorry, Catherine. We'll, we'll open this up to your questions because I don't know. I don't want to monopolize. I don't want to. Yes, I do, but I'm not going to monopolize. Um, I noticed that. Well, how many art fairs do you do a year, ballpark? Four or five. And how many of those are photography fairs? One. And how do the sales in a photography fair compare to a regular schmoozy art fair? 
Um, unfortunately, um, not as well. It used to be the reverse, but now, um, for whatever reason, whatever the, maybe it's the artwork I have, or I, I don't really know, um, but a pad, which is our big photo fair in New York, uh, really is probably one of my, is probably the one fair recently that I, that I don't make as much um, as others, but it's still, you know, one of the most important fairs that I, that I do. And I'm also the vice president, so kind of, kind of uh, support that. <laughs> and, but that show happens in other places also besides New York. Doesn't that iPad happen more than once a year? No, iPad's just in APAD? New York. Yeah. Okay. We tried to do it in other cities, but membership just couldn't support it. So we, we, we dropped that idea. All right, let's see if anybody's got some questions here. Um, Sharon, do you have your hand up? Do you want to say something? I've unmuted you. Sharon? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, you were saying that very often the relationship between a gallery and artist ends after 10 to 12 years. And um, I was wondering, are there hard feelings? Do the artists continue to come to your gallery to openings after you sever a relationship or the artist yeah. severs a relationship? That is a really great question because I can say hands down, and of course I, I would, Paul would love for me to name them, but I won't. But there are, there are photographers in Chicago that never stepped foot in my gallery until I represented them, then came to every single opening. And then when we parted ways, has never stepped foot back in the gallery. So obviously it was all about them. And I, I gather, and my staff and I talk about this a lot, you know, I would think that artists want to see other artists' works. You know, that, it, that a relationship with a gallery is not just about you. It's about, you know, your place in the art world and that you should be wanting to see what other people are doing. But what's really funny, well, it's not funny, haha, -ha, it's kind of pathetic, is um, I have lost some, they're not really friendships, if you will, but, um, but you know, hurt feelings, I suppose, even though everybody said everything was fine. Um, there are artists who've never stepped foot in the gallery. Um, but on the other hand, I just got an um, email uh, from a photographer who I can't, you know, it, it's the only show I've ever canceled in the history of the gallery. I canceled his show two months before, you know, he, he sent in the works two months prior, um, which is our agreement, you know, so that I can get it matted and framed. And I just, I couldn't do the show. I just couldn't do it. And I canceled the show. And um, of course, he was livid as he should have been. Um, but there were many reasons why I had to cancel, and um, one of which was I found that it was going to be an embarrassment to put the work up uh, for both me and him. Um, and I just received an email this week asking if we could give it a try again, and, and that was probably 10 years ago. So, you know, it goes both ways. Um, but I try to just be realistic with my artists. I mean, I'm kind of known for being just honest, and so... And I have no problems admitting when I can't do something for an artist. I don't think it's a reflection on your work. It's just a reflection about how I feel about your work. I'm just one dealer. And um, I don't think that my opinion's worth anything beyond the mirror. Um, you know, and so I, I, you know, I hope that artists don't have hurt feelings, but I, you know, um, I try to get them, I mean, I just severed a relationship with an extremely well-known photographer who's a very dear friend, and I set him up uh, right next door um, at Stephen Dater, who's a very dear friend of mine. I called him, I said, you should be representing him, not me. And they just had a very successful show. So sometimes it all works out. Can I, can I also ask what your gallery contract looks like with your artist? Well, it used to be a 30-page um, contract, Whoa. but I haven't... Um, I haven't signed a contract in years. It's it's really a, it's a it's, it's a statement of consignment, if you will, um, and it states something like I don't know there are, I there are like ten or twelve points to it. Um, the gallery and the artist split fifty fifty. Uh, we agree to split discounts up to fifteen percent. Anything thereafter, I absorb. Um, artists are responsible for 
the, the creation of your own work, because that's become a thing recently, um, and that I take care of matting and framing and shipping and everything there else, but your responsibility is to get me your, your work. Um, that I, you know, will ensure work up to, um, you know, for the current value. You get a record of an inventory, um, that the contract is non-binding, which is kind of ironic because anybody can break it in anyway. Um, and then something like about exhibitions, you get, you know, 250 announcement cards, some, some innocuous kind of stuff. Um, you know, but the reality is, is that um, terms of consignment now, are, I think, are what most of us call contracts. We'll discuss this in a later class when we have a lawyer discuss uh, dealer artist re, uh, relationships and contracts and consignment law and copyright issues. Um, which is pretty colorful. All right, that's cool. Sharon, thank you. I think I, there's a bunch of people whose hands are up, but I saw Joyce's first. Joyce, go ahead. Am I on? You're on, go ahead. Uh, Catherine, I had a, uh, two, two questions. Um, one is, um, what's oh, wrong? Hey. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, what's wrong with Chicago in the fact that it doesn't seem to have a big photography base. Uh, we can't seem to uh, have a, a, a good magazine. We can't have our own photography shows, etc. And then my second question is, um, could you talk a little bit about how you close sales? <laughs> um, that's funny. Um, okay, so the first one. Um, I'm, I really can't, I, I really don't have an answer. I, I, I'm clueless. Um, when I opened up the gallery, there was only one photography gallery in Chicago. It was Edwin Houck. He didn't represent living artists, and so it was sort of a slam dunk for me to do this. Um, they didn't need me back in New York, and so I stayed in Chicago. Um, since then, we've had a couple of photo galleries come and go, and, um, and, and me and Steve and Martha Schneider have, have you know, have lasted. Um, I, I don't know that that the that the correct or the not correct. You, you know, sorry about that. But that the question is why aren't there more photo galleries? The question might be why aren't there more photo collectors to support more galleries? And that's a much larger and and if I had the answer to that, boy, I I, I wouldn't be traveling so much. Um, so I don't know that it's you know I think it's. Um, you know, it goes hand in hand. If there aren't enough collectors here, uh, galleries can't stay open. Uh, there's certainly a lot of venues in Chicago for photographers. I mean, there's just a ton of venues. Um, I mean, I just juried something, uh, the show's opening this weekend up in Evanston, a gallery called Perspective. Um, and I live right up here, and, and, and I, you know, honestly, I haven't been to it because they're open Tuesday through Saturday, the same hours as us. Um, so they're they're doing a photo show, and as you know, because we met at, at at Filter Photo, that there's Filter Photo, and uh, the Cultural Center is many exhibition spaces. I mean, there's a lot of not-for-profit exhibition spaces in Chicago. Now, for-profit, I'm gonna say that if we had more collectors in Chicago to support more galleries, you'd see them opening. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that because I do think we have a big problem here with the collector base. Um, how you close a sale? <laughs> um, I have to say, and I know this is going to sound like bullshit, but um, I really don't think you can force people to buy. I mean, when people come into the gallery, A, they're coming in because they, well, half the people don't know why they're coming in, you know, right? They're like wandering around. They have no clue. You know, they're just wandering around. That's fine. The people who come in specifically to look at something have already made that decision that they're coming in to look at something. So, you know, I've always found that education is my job, and 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 that is my job to know more about what they're looking at than they do, to put them at ease and to help them understand their vision. Sometimes that's easier than said than done. Um, but I've never, well, that's not true. I mean, I can close a sale. I mean, if the sale is there to be had, I can close it. I mean, I can see it, you know, they just need to be, um, they need to be helped. Um, my staff, I always tell them not to 
to try to go that route because it ends up sounding like a sales pitch, which is the worst way to quote close a sale. Um, and I don't know how to really explain it. Um, it's the way in which you have, you speak with people. It's the way in which, you know, I always say to them, if they can't, if they don't, want, if they can't make a decision, I tell them not to make a decision. You know, I mean, I've said it time and time again in the gallery. If it's meant, if you're meant to own it, it's going to wait for you. Go home. You know, some people might call that a sales pitch. I, I don't call it a sales pitch. I mean, you know, I collect, and I know. I buy something as soon as I see it. I mean, it's like a five second. It's not even a five second. Like I see it, I buy it, done. If I have to go home, I don't buy it. But, you know, a lot of people need need to process. And so, you know, I give them the freedom to do that. And if anything, as far as closing a sale, you know, if I see they're struggling with finances, I'll offer them a payment plan. Um, and that'll usually break, you know, that's going to usually do it. Um, but mind you, if you're a, you know, an artist working one-on-one -on -one with a collector or a buyer, do, and you offer them a payment plan, you do not give them your art until you've been paid in full. Um, and I mean, that seems sort of obvious to those of us in business, but I've seen a lot of artists. I never did it that way. Day. Pardon me? I never did it that way. Yeah, well, know. there you go, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but... It's uh, and, and I don't do very long payment plans. I'm not interested in uh, in uh, you know going after people. So I usually make them pay half up front so that I pay my artist instantly. And then if they screw up, it's all on me. Um, and that's just me. That's just the way I was raised. And so they they cannot do a payment plan without putting half down. Uh, I just think an artist should get their share. And uh, they shouldn't be held waiting for somebody else's uh, payment. So that's how I do. I think that's a wiser policy than the one I have. <laughs> no comment. Mm -hmm. Joyce, do you have any, do you want to say anything more, or should we move on? No, no, thank you very much. You're totally welcome, Melanie. It's your turn. Go ahead. All right. Okay, you unmute yours. There you go. Go ahead. Um, I really respect that. Um, you pay the artists up front. That's really wonderful. Um, I, you said you have 30 artists, and I wondered how many artists do you take to art fairs, and how do you make that decision? Um, another great question. Um, well, let's see. I think I have maybe like 36 but uh, artists, and um, and actually, it's a really tough. It, 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 it's very um, instant, my decision making, but it, it's sort of based on um, a, a lot of mistakes. Um, I find if I'm doing a photo fair like APAD, I, I tend to take on artists who are unknown and then they get known and then other dealers take them on. So we go to a fair and two or three of us have the same work on the wall, right? So that's happened to me time and time again because I do champion the unknown. So if I do my job well, then they get known, so other dealers take them on. So in the beginning, it was great because I'd be the only one with their work. And then you'd start to see, oh, you know, Edelman and so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so all have Julie Blackman on the wall. So now I have decided that I'm only taking artists, like when I do APAD, um, Nobody else will have my art. The artists that I'm taking, nobody else will have them. It eliminates um, this horrific competition that ha happens at an art fair between dealers, um, i.e., you have a, a, a photo on the wall and somebody else is the same one, and, and they come up to you and they're like, well, you know, Bob's going to give me 15%. Will you match that? And it's like, it's just bullshit. And that's a part of the business I really have no tolerance for. So. So I try to take artists now um, that nobody else is going to have. So A, that means if somebody really wants it, they have to buy it from me. I don't give away discounts uh, easily, which which i am uh, been accused of being a little, uh, you know, not bending on that. But I, I do believe that artists deserve the prices that we set. And I also know they can't get it anywhere else. So it's like they, they, there's no there's, – there's, it ends the whole banter that seems to happen between um, collector and dealer at an art fair. Um, I try to take work that I think people should see. 
I try to balance that with work that people expect me to have. And uh, and then, then hopefully between those two, it's saleable work. And, and there's usually some work that I know I absolutely will not sell, but I want to give the artist um, the exposure to um, all the curators and collectors that will be there. So and it's a fine balance because, you know, if I have a whole lot of work that doesn't sell <laughs> um, with the average, you know, art fair costing thirty to $50,000, um, that's a lot of photos to sell. Um, you know, so I have to really balance it out carefully. Uh, How often does somebody from the gallery like speak? Go ahead. I'm sorry, what? Go ahead, Melanie. Somebody for I'll ask a question. We'll go back to Melanie. How often does somebody from the gallery communicate with each of the artists that you work with, Catherine? How often do I communicate with them? Yeah, or somebody else from the gallery. Are you? I mean, are you guys in touch at least monthly? No. No, we don't. We don't call and just say hey. Um, we communicate with our artists that are selling. Um, we communicate with our artists that stay in touch with us. You know, we're one person. Uh, I've got thirty some odd. I no, I'm not a mother. I don't. I don't sit and call my artists every month and say hey, how you doing? Um, I, I think it's the job of the artist to stay in touch with the dealer, and I stay in touch with them as as much as. Um, as, as as active as they are in the gallery. So, you know, there's some artists I haven't talked to in quite some time, and most artists, uh, you know, shoot me an email or a phone call every now and then just to check in, see how we're all doing. You know, it's up to them to send me new work, it's not up to me to call and say, do you have new work? Uh, an artist that needs a dealer to do that is not going to have a dealer. Um, the artists have to be really proactive when you have a dealer and stay in touch and, you know, send us, um, you know, JPEGs and new work or keep your website up to date. and um, let us know what's going on. It sounds to me like you have a really healthy relationship with your artists and that you respect them. And I don't know that that's as true for many other dealers as true as it is for you. So, you know. Well, there's some of my artists who are pissed off at me because, you know, they don't go to art fairs. Um, to finish up with uh, the last question, I mean, I'd probably take six or seven artists to a fair. So, you know, that's 26, 28 artists that aren't going to a fair. Um, and it tends to be the same artist that I'm taking to fairs. Um, but if an artist gets in my face, you know, uh, and I see new work and I get excited, they're going to be at the forefront of my brain. Um, I'm, I'm balancing everything. I'm trying to, like, you know, keep a gallery, a, keep a business running and moving forward. And so an artist just has to be aware that they're just one person and they should stay in touch with us. Beautiful. And All I right. have a couple of artists who are pretty pissed off that I don't call and wish them a, you know, Merry Christmas or something. <laughs> okay, cool. Dana, your turn. Hi, Catherine. You actually represent a good friend of mine, Michelle Kime. Oh, there you go. Yeah. And um, I guess my question is, on the artist side, how much of the work do you expect us to do for sale? This is something I called Paul with this morning. That's, a, that's, that to yeah. that's really in interesting. You know, um, I have to say that um, I really respect artists who get involved in the business side of their work so long as they don't screw it up. Um, you know, obviously part of the reason that artists come to galleries is hopefully, hopefully, um, we're good business people. You make the art, as I always say to my artists, you make the art and I'm if I do my job right, I sell it or I show it. Um, but I have to say, I really I have some artists that, right now that are very active in in keeping the momentum going, understanding that I'm just one dealer. You know, I can't do everything for you. You need to keep yourself out there, but you also need to be respectful of the relationship. So it, it really depends. You know, take you know take your friend Michelle. I mean, uh, you know, when things come her way, you know, the agreement is. One of the major agreements on the on the contract is artists can't sell out of their studios because um, obviously if they can, there's no need for a dealer. Um, so you know when things come their way, they always forward the emails to us, and and but it keeps them involved in it, and they also get to see you know sometimes people are just interested but they don't want to spend the money. Um, but I think the more active an artist is in their own career. Uh, the better chance they have of being successful. If you wait for somebody like me to do it all, unless I only represent two or three people, mm -hmm. it's 
it's just not going to happen at the pace that it may happen if you get engaged. But on that note, you also have to not make mistakes. You know, you don't go around quoting prices. You don't, you don't get involved in the minutia where you could make a mistake. But I think it's great for artists to be constantly getting their work out there, um, constantly trying to meet with curators, you know, because you are, you know, by and large, they, collectors like to meet you, curators like to meet you, but they know that we, we're the package. We're going to package you, right? We're going to make you better than you are, so to speak, right? You know, no offense, but that's our job, right? We edit you. We, 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 we package you. Um, and and it, and and you don't always know your best, as you all know. You you, you are your worst editors, right? I mean, you don't know your best work, um, and so you you know you need somebody on to do that for you. And that that's probably one of the biggest um, advantages of a dealer, if they're any you know if they're active. Some now it's like what Paul said. There there's some dealers that aren't very active with their artists. Um, you know, take take Michelle, for example. I mean, I've been sitting and editing her new work for, I don't know, it seems like years now. Um, and, you know, I say some tough things to her. And it's, you know, it's not, oh, these are great, <laughs> um, unless they are. Uh, so, uh, you know, bottom line is be as active as you can. Thank cool. You. All right. Let's go to Patricia. Your turn. Hi, thanks so much for talking to us tonight. Um, you, know, you said some really interesting things, and I was curious, you hadn't talked about the Chicago Project. I was looking at your website, and I was curious how that came about. Yeah, the Chicago Project came about in 2003 when um, I was really, really bored, and it was summer. Um, gallery was not doing well. I, you know, there's such peaks and valleys in the in this business that, you know, 2003, I guess I'd been open, what, it was like the 15-year mark, and I was just, you know, it was like, do I stay open? Do I keep going? And I was bored, and so um, I was sitting been talking with my assistant, and I realized that I didn't represent a lot of Chicago photographers. Now, I've been, you know, I've, I've represented a lot. I've shown a lot. Um, some people can say I've been through a lot of photographers, but it, it dawned on me that um, I really didn't have a lot of Chicagoans, and I was really worried that I wasn't, you know, being respectful to the city that I'm living in. You know, I mean, I'm here for a reason, and there have to be artists out there that need help that I can help without representing them. So the idea was to, the idea was founded that it would be the Chicago Project, which would be this online only gallery. Uh, so it didn't cost me any money, which is very important. You know, I didn't have to stock the work, insure it, et cetera. And it would be open to Chicago artists who didn't have representation. And that was the only parameter. They didn't have representation, and that if they were accepted onto the site, we'd put six or nine pieces up and expose, you know, their work to um, my audience, who, um, you know, at that stage was pretty national, if you will. Well, I mean, it really took off. Um, as a matter of fact, I have to say that almost every curator I talk to, that's the first thing they talk to me about, is, is the Chicago project, which is nice, but. You know, um, and it's it's good that they're looking at it. And I've I've made some, you know, every two years now we do a show from the project. Uh, it's an ongoing. We actively we just took somebody on Saturday. Uh, it's, you know, it's based on submissions. Um, I my assistant Julie runs it. Um, I get the the final say of to yes or no if the work comes on the project. But after that, Julie runs it. Um, it's been extremely successful, but I also decided that um, I had to, you know, I guess I didn't realize I had made this distinction, but I said local, and being the, you know, kind of New Yorker that I am, I decided local really was Ohio, Illinois, you know, Wisconsin, you know, so it became the Midwest, even though we call it the Chicago Project, just because, you know, there are a lot of, um, you know, there, there, there are a lot of people in small towns that, um need to get their work seen. So it's a, it's a jumping off point. And uh, there's one artist that transitioned from the Chicago Project into the gallery. Um, but I mean, and I guess that's a goal for the artist maybe, but that, that's not my goal with the project. 
it's just to give um, a little bit of exposure uh, to um, artists that are just starting out that need to learn, you know, how do I size my prints, how do I addition them, how do I price them, and we help you figure that all out. And so it's it's sort of a, if you will, an altruistic pursuit that I find really, really, really important um, as I operate a for-profit. Uh, maybe it's a part of me that kind of always thought maybe I should do something uh, not for profit. So it's my way of helping artists out. And, and it works really well. I mean, people make sales, and we don't take the same discount because I don't have to insure the work. Um, and that's, you know, once again, that's my call. And, um, and I, I really enjoy it. I really enjoy it. Cool. What year, you started that what year? 2003. Oh, wow. That's, wow, that's really interesting. You know, I, I just have a real quick one. Um, you, when you were talking earlier about um, how you close a sale, you said something, and I wasn't sure if you meant to say it this way or not, and I was really intrigued. You said that you help them understand their vision. So are you helping people who are coming in to buy understand why they're attracted to a piece? Yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, a lot of people come into galleries not because they know, yeah. You know, the way that I look at it, and I've always said, they're collectors and then they're buyers. Very few dealers, we, very few of us get to work with collectors. We're, we're really pe dealing with people who are buying art for their home like they would furniture. You know, they, they've got a spot on the wall. They know they want something, et cetera. And it is, the, you know, the piece over the green couch, if you will. Um, but they just don't know what they like. You know, they usually come in and they tell me what they don't like. So then I instantly show them that because I can, you know, because I think it's really important to break down that barrier of, you know, if somebody comes in and says, I, I, I hate whatever. You know, I had one person who said to me, I hate people pictures. And I just started laughing because that's, you know, they have albums of their family at home, right? Um, but I understood what they were saying. They didn't want to look at people they didn't know on their walls, right? And my entire collection in this house is people is like people I don't know, which I find really funny because I started out also collecting non-people images. But yeah, our job is to help them figure out what they like, you know, narrow it down. And um, before the internet, it was a lot of schlepping with work, you know, pulling out boxes. Now, um, I just we just sit down on the with um, my website, you know, which we pour a lot of time and money into, and um, and and we can go through it really fast without you know possibly damaging work and without them feeling you know that courteous oh that's so nice when they don't like it you know I mean you got to break down a lot of the the barriers that people feel when walking into a gallery that you know has been perpetuated by you know, the Gagosians of the world. Um, most of us are extremely approachable, and um, we just want to help you find something that you want to live with and, and buy. Cool. Let's go to Alana. Alana, take it away. Hi there. Um, you, you did mention that um, you find artists through curating, and I know you're not, uh, you, you, ha you said you have, um, you've taken very few artists, but in the past and um, and now, are there other ways that that you get um, inspired by artists? That other ways that you see artists that might inspire you? Um, well, we don't take submissions anymore um, because, frankly, it's, you know that's not how I was finding artists. So. I mean, the way that I find artists hasn't really changed, I, except I don't have to travel as much. I used to um, go all over the country all the time looking at shows, you know, talking to people. Um, I pretty much spend my time staring at a computer going from one blog to another blog and somebody's name is, you know, and constantly looking at images online, um, which is a very democratic, extremely easy way of looking at work. Um, it means that people who don't even know about me, uh, I get to see their work. So it's it, it's really a you know opened up the market in a way that's been phenomenal if artists are taking advantage of it. And I don't you know, but also magazines. I mean, you know, I look at everything. I mean, I look at bylines cool. on all all things. Uh, you know, if I like an image. 
Catherine, thanks. I, I think we've got like four questions left, and I think we should cut this off like in 10 minutes or so. So keep that in mind. Um, Jerry, take it away. Your turn. Hi, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, Catherine, it sounds like you have a great deal of uh, background and experience, and I wonder if you've given any thought to, um, uh, you know, artists who aren't photographers who work in other media. Um, if, any thought, advice for uh, us who are not photographers? Well, um, as far as how to get into a gallery? Well, no. I mean, you've covered a lot uh, that can be said to be, you know, um, just sort of a gallerist approach and uh, general ideas. But, so maybe you've already answered my question, but I'm still trying to pick out threads here. Uh, do you have any other insights or even advice for those who uh, aren't photographers who are working in other media? Yeah, does I mean, it all come down to the same thing by and large? Well, I, I think it probably all comes down to the same thing, although I have to say that um, I think the photo industry has done a much better job, if you will, of, of giving artists who work in, with the camera uh, avenues that, that, that you don't have in the painting world, like you don't have a critical mass or or um, the Houston Photo the Festival down there. You don't have Camera Lucy. They, they, there are all these places where artists go with their portfolios. Right. Curators and dealers come and meet with them, and we do these like 20-minute, you know, in, uh, reviews. I mean, it's an incredible industry that the photo market's built that helps artists get have critiques and get seen that I don't see happening. Uh, with painters or sculptors, et cetera, maybe because it's not as portable a medium. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because um, it's sort of like the bastard child, too, because photography has been overlooked you know, or not given the same stature for a while, so that I think people stepped it up. I think the same thing tends to be true of um, digital art, where there's, you know, there's a, a, a similar effort to get attention for it. it. It could be. I mean, it's a very portable medium, though, so... I mean, you can't be schlepping around paintings, um, but uh, you know. So I think there are probably more avenues for yeah for for the the photo digital world. But I would say that the goal is still the same. You know, get your get your name out there, have an active website, be applying to things, uh, know what's going on in your community, uh, show up even if they're not showing your work. Um, yeah. You know, go to the galleries and and get yourself known. At least mm -hmm. visibly, you know, we're not going to remember your names. I mean, I, you know, hey, look, I, you know, the older, I just hit 50, and I'm certainly not, you know, the names we're going to forget, but we don't forget faces. I don't feel sorry for you about this 50 thing, girl. It's okay. Come on. <laughs> you keep trying to play that card over here, and it's not cutting it. Jerry, thank you. Let's go. Huh? Yeah, right. I'm your mom. Um, <laughs> I think right. I'm a senior citizen here, too. <laughs> We're proud senior citizens. Monica, go ahead and ask the question. There's one senior citizen to another. Can you hear me? Y yes. Oh, okay. I'm nervous ever since the last time. Um, it's a little quiet, but, you know, yell. I'll come closer. There you go. Uh, Kathy, it's really nice to, to, to find you. Yeah, you can take it out and... Um, Put a fork in it, see if the juice comes out red or... Well, pink. wait, Alana, I don't want to hear about the fork and the juice. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Put a fork in it. Monica, back to you. <laughs> I don't. I can't remember what I was going to say. Uh, Kathy, I was really, I was really spending a lot of time on your website, and I was particularly taken with the uh, uh, Russian photographer who is working with the mother and child and is documenting the uh, uh, progression of their relationship. I, I thought that was some of the most stunning imagery I've seen in a long time. So congratulations. Um, Thank you. How did you find her? Um, huh. I don't remember. No, I just finished her show, so you'd think I'd remember. But, um, oh, that's right. So, okay, her name is Victoria Sorochinsky, and my assistant Trevor saw her work on a blog. And he uh, sent it. He, you know, shot me the the um, the web link, and um, and I looked at it, and I was like, "This is pretty good stuff." And he was thinking about it uh, for this other project that we have called Control P, which is this other project which we don't have time to go into. Um, and I thought, well, this is like beyond, 
that project and um and we started talking and um you know we just finished her show um but she's a good example of somebody that um you know i i told her i'm not sure you know how successful we're going to be um because i had a feeling that it's going to be a tough sell and and we didn't sell anything and i um don't feel good about that one iota so she's coming with me you know, I'll be taking the work to the next art fair because, you know, I really want to try and sell some pieces for it cost her a lot of money to print the work up and um and I really believe in it. But um but we found it through a blog. Cool. I think we got a couple more questions. Monica, is that okay? Can we move on? Yeah. Thank you very much. Karen, your turn. Well, I have um Kathy, thank you so much. I have so many questions, but now I'm kinda of curious Regarding that, um, photographer, do you ever try to approach, um, like, a foundation or a corporation or a company or, or a person that you think might, um, like, do you seek out the people you think might be interested in that photographer or that artist? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, that's part of uh, selling is trying to figure out who do I know the collects work like this and you know I, I I pulled out all the stops I mean I I really did work it um, I even went to the one of the Canadian councils to that only buy Canadian um, that, that's a long-term approach um, yeah I, I do everything I mean we don't go to foundations because generally foundations don't want to work for for profit um, so foundations work with the artists but they don't necessarily want to work with us um and uh um but yeah i mean i you know i'd like to believe that i i gave it a, a very solid um you know heartfelt try um sure that um there's more i could have done um it's a very difficult time right now in the art world um people are buying what they know uh, as opposed to well that's not really true and, and at least in the gallery art fairs are a whole nother world um but yeah i mean i i i those avenues that you discussed are are actually more thinking uh it's more of a not for profit mentality than a for profit we really can't go to some of those places unless we're trying to help you the artist raise money for a project that we're going to end up then showing if you will um, so right now, Victoria's got a book deal on the table, and I'm, and she needs to raise $18,000. And so I'm trying to get a foundation to help sponsor it, and it's all this crap, you know. And, and, and of course, the publisher wants an answer in two months, and the deadlines, you know, for the submissions aren't for another eight months. And so you got, you know, but I'm, I'm trying really hard to get her this book, uh, well, to get her the money for the book uh, before the time lapses. Uh, but other than that, we got to, you know, the not-for-profit and for-profit worlds don't always merge too well. Let's take one more question, and let's have that be from Caleb. And Caleb, I have now unmuted you. Sure. I was wondering um, what, what uh, you talked about having the artist print out the work for a show. Does the um, how much does seeing the actual printed piece? Um, play into the same work versus Sorry, I can't really hear you very well. I can't really hear you very well. Yes, okay. Is um, can you hear me now? Yeah, but it might be the echo, so let's try and say it as few words as possible. Okay, I just was wondering about how important it is to see the, the finished uh, print and the Hey, let me mute you, and I'm gonna. Okay, I've I, muted I you because I, I think I know what you're asking. Um, I think he's asking how much is it? Is it you know how much can you rely on seeing the work on the internet, and how much do you have to see the actual piece to make a proper decision? Well, <laughs> um, I haven't been. I I I have to say I make almost all my decisions these days off of JPEGs, which is how my clients make their decisions as well. If you think about it, I mean. At this stage, I'd say 90% of my 90 to 95% of my sales are out of state, which means that my clients are not in Chicago, and so they're purchasing via my website. So I'm making the same decisions that my clients are. Uh, um, the show that I have that I'm installing tomorrow, we we didn't even see the photographs. Um, they went from a lab in Canada 
straight to a framer in Chicago, and I will unwrap them tomorrow. Um, I certainly hope they're as good in person as they are online, um, and I haven't been haven't been surprised uh, yet uh, in in a negative way. Uh, but then with black and white work, gel and silver work, um, I definitely have to see the print quality before I'll show an artist. And it's a very big difference between digital color and good old fashioned gel and silver. Cool. All right. Um, Catherine, you've said an awful lot and it's been really informative and I love you dearly and you've been really, really generous and I think you're a one, you know, every, you know, you're a wonderful dealer. So, um, you know, and you have a really good reputation and you've been exemplary and a leader in Chicago and elsewhere in the world. Um, I think people look up to you. I think artists respect you. I think you're doing a particularly good job. And I think it's really, you know, fabulous that you're here tonight and share all of this input with us. I, I, I love you for it, and I appreciate it, and I thank you. Um, well, I would just like you to tape that and let me play it to myself every now and then. I recorded this on two different media <laughs> right now, and um, I, will, I will send you that. Um, thank you. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, no, you. you're, you're doing great. And, you know, you might need to remind me, me that I've said that at some point. But, um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's wonderful. Let me I'll tell you what. Let me unmute everybody so that everybody, the chorus of cheers can go out. Ah. Everybody's all right. <laughs> Thank it's amazing. Thank you. 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 Thank you.